Hello friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, coming to you in the summer of 2020, and as we sit here in the depths of the COVID-1984 crisis, and as I recently reported on Propaganda Watch, I think the COVID-1984 agenda is going to transition us ultimately from a biosecurity paradigm into a transhuman paradigm, and I realize there are a lot of new listeners to the Corbett Report who may not know about the history of this philosophy of transhumanism or where the transhuman proponents seek to take the human race. So in order to fill in any gaps in that knowledge, I'm re-releasing this old podcast from 2008, but one that I think is, if not as relevant as ever, perhaps even more so, as it goes through the history of this ideology, where the philosophy comes from, and what it aims at. So I hope you will take this uh, this opportunity to refresh your knowledge or to acquaint yourself for the first time with transhumanism in greater depth. Obviously, as this takes on more and more of a headline news uh, flavor, as the Neuralink brain chip and other such things are introduced to the public, I think this is a topic we will have to revisit and re-revisit. But this should be a good primer for people who are just dipping their toes into this water. As always, the show notes will be at CorbettReport.com. Just follow the links and enjoy this blast from the past. Sometimes I dream of living forever. To never die. Not unless I wanted to. Actually, I dream I could just know everything. To have super intelligence. And in the age of accelerating technologies in which we extend the cognitive reach of our minds, the perimeters of our humanness with these extensions of self, these exoskeletons, these technological scaffoldings, you know, the wings of our aircrafts and the signals traveling through our smartphones, sending our thoughts electrified at the speed of light across oceans of sky. We redefine and extend what it means to be human. To focus on the technologies of the future, nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, cognitive technology, genetics, and robotics. Doing so will allow us to find new sources of energy, create fundamentally new architecture and transportation, allow unprecedented developments of human cognitive abilities, refine artificial intelligences, and brain-computer interfaces, simulate complex systems, create humanoid robots and cyborgs, and with the help of nanorobots, we may develop manageable matter. Find ways to transfer one's personality to an artificial carrier. Welcome to episode 57 of the Corbett Report. Transhumanism and you. So what exactly is this revolutionary transhumanist philosophy that has the YouTube commentators in a sweaty palmed tizzy? It certainly does sound pie in the sky to be talking about ending death ending disease, ending stupidity, ending basically everything we've come to know as the human condition by recourse to technological development. But rest assured, this is not science fiction. This is, in fact, a very real movement. And you can find the World Transhumanist Association at transhumanism.org. The tagline for the website is For the Ethical Use of Technology to Extend Human Capabilities. And I read from the Transhumanist Declaration that can be found on transhumanism.org. The Transhumanist Declaration, quote, 1. Humanity will be radically changed by technology in the future. We foresee the feasibility of redesigning the human condition, including such parameters as the inevitability of aging, limitations on human and artificial intellects, unchosen psychology, suffering, and our confinement to the planet Earth. 2. Systematic research should be put into understanding these coming developments and their long-term consequences. 3. Transhumanists think that by being generally open and embracing of new technology, we have a better chance of turning it to our advantage than if we try to ban or prohibit it. 4. Transhumanists advocate the moral right for those who so wish to use technology to extend their mental and physical, including reproductive, capacities, and to improve their control over their own lives. We seek personal growth beyond our current biological limitations. 5. 
In planning for the future, it is mandatory to take into account the prospect of dramatic progress in technological capabilities. It would be tragic if the potential benefits failed to materialize because of technophobia and unnecessary prohibitions. On the other hand, it would also be tragic if intelligent life went extinct because of some disaster or war involving advanced technologies. 6. We need to create forums where people can rationally debate what needs to be done and a social order where responsible decisions can be implemented. 7. Transhumanism advocates the well-being of all sentience, whether in artificial intellects, humans, post-humans, or non-human animals, and encompasses many principles of modern humanism. Transhumanism does not support any particular party, politician, or political platform. End quote. Now granted, all of this seems quite reasonable, and it would be difficult to argue with any of those particular points. Of course, technology is advancing at an ever-increasing rate. The acceleration of the change of technology is itself increasing, and we are not likely to stop technological innovation by wishing the world would simply slow down. So it does seem that we need to take some sort of philosophical stance on the issue of technological development, especially in this age of genetic research, biological research, and our increasing understanding of neurology. Of course, it's always important to take a look at where a philosophical movement derives its roots. So let's go back to the person who coined the term transhumanism. That is, of course, Julian Huxley. You can actually read the essay in which Julian Huxley coined the term transhumanism from his collection, In New Bottles for New Wine, which is reprinted on the transhumanism.org website. In that essay, Huxley writes, quote, that quality of people, not mere quantity, is what we must aim at, and therefore that a concerted policy is required to prevent the present flood of population increase from wrecking all our hopes for a better world. End quote. Now, if that rhetoric seems familiar, that must mean that you're paying attention, because, of course, this is the very rhetoric that we have covered in previous episodes of the Corbett Report, including, of course, episode 17 on the myth of overpopulation. Now, if the name Julian Huxley rings a bell, then again you've been paying attention, and you'll remember from a previous episode of the Corbett Report that Julian Huxley was in fact not only the founder of UNESCO, and thus the author of UNESCO's founding document, entitled UNESCO, Its Philosophy and Purpose, in which he writes about the need to make eugenics a socially acceptable ideal once again but also a president of the British Eugenics Society, the grandson of T.H. Huxley, also known as Darwin's Bulldog, a founder of the World Wildlife Fund, along with Nazi eugenicist Prince Philip, a member of the Euthanasia Society, and a leader in the Abortion Law Reform Association. Julian Huxley was also the brother of Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, who gave a speech at Berkeley in 1962, in which he talked about technology being developed at that time in the 1960s to control the masses through their brain chemistry. Well then, uh, very briefly, let me speak about uh, one of the more recent uh, developments of, uh, uh, in the sphere of, uh, of neurology, the uh, the implantation of uh, electrodes in the brain. Uh, this, of course, has been done on a large scale in uh, in animals, and in uh, uh, in a few cases, it's uh, been done in hopeless um, in cases of the hopelessly insane. Uh, and it is anybody who's uh, watched uh, the behaviour of rats with uh, electrodes planted in different centres. Uh, must uh, come away from this experience with the most extraordinary doubts about what on earth is in store for us if ever this uh, is got hold of by a dictator if uh, the uh, I, mean, I saw not long ago some rats uh, in Magoon's laboratory at UCLA uh, there were two sets of them one with electrodes planted in a pleasure centre and these rats were the, the technique was that they had a bar which they pressed uh, and which um, 
turned on a very small current for a short space of time, which uh, we had a wire connected with that electrode, and which um, stimulated this pleasure centre, which was evidently absolutely ecstatic, because these rats were were pressing the bar 18,000 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, apparently if you kept them from pressing the bar for a day they would press the bar 36,000 times on the following day and would fall till they fell down in complete exhaustion <laughs> uh, and they would neither eat nor be interested in the, uh, the opposite sex and would just go on pressing this bar uh, then the most extraordinary rats were those where the electrode was planted halfway between a pleasure and a pain centre and where evidently the the result was a kind of mixture of the most wonderful ecstasy in being on the rack at the same time. <laughs> and you, you would see the rat sort of looking at its bar and sort of saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> and finally would approach and do it. And then it would go back and, uh, with this awful, uh, I mean, the, uh, if one can humanize or anthropomorphize I mean he was feeling something terribly mixed and he would wait for quite a long time before pressing the bar again but he would always press it again I mean <laughs> this was the, the extraordinary thing and the, in the, I noticed in this um, most recent issue of the Scientific American there's a very interesting article on electrodes in the brains of chickens uh, where the, the technique is, is very ingenious you, you sink into their brains a little um, socket with, with a screw on it and the electrode then can be screwed deeper and deeper into the brain stem and you can test at any moment according to the depth of uh, it goes in fractions of a millimetre of what you're stimulating and, and these creatures are not merely uh, stimulated by wire they are fitted with a, a miniaturized radio receiver weighing less than an ounce which is attached to them uh, so that they can be communicated with uh, at a distance. I mean, they can run about in the barnyard and you can press the button and uh, the, this particular area of the brain to which the electrode has been screwed down to will be stimulated and <coughs> you will get these uh, fantastic phenomena that a, uh, a sleepy chicken will suddenly get up and rush about or a, uh, an active chicken will suddenly sit down and go to sleep or a hen will suddenly start sitting as though it were uh, we're hatching out an egg uh, or a rooster will start fighting or will suddenly go into a state of extreme depression uh, the, uh, the whole uh, picture of the absolute control of the drives is, a, uh, is terrifying and uh, in the cases the few cases in which this has been done with very sick human beings uh, the effects are evidently very remarkable too I was talking last summer to, uh, in England to Gray Walter, who is the um, most eminent exponent of the electroencephalogram techniques in England, and he was telling me that they, he's seen hopeless uh, inmates of asylums with these things in, in their heads, and that uh, these people were suffering from the uncontrollable depression. And they were, they'd had a the electrodes inserted into something resembling evidently the pleasure center of the rat uh, anyhow when they felt too bad they just pressed a button in the battery in their pocket and he said the result was fantastic the mouth would go down would suddenly turn up and they would evidently feel very cheerful and happy so that <clears throat> here again one sees uh, the most uh, uh, extraordinary uh, revolutionary techniques uh, which are now available uh, to us. Now, it's evident from this clip that Aldous Huxley takes some form of intellectual delight at the prospect of controlling humans through these electrodes implanted in their brain, even though the gist of the lecture on a surface level is supposedly a warning against this type of technology being used for dictatorial purposes. But I think at the very least, the involvement of his brother and many members of the Huxley family in the eugenics society would give the lie to the idea that Huxley really does have the general population's best interests at heart. But regardless of the Huxleys and their eugenicist fantasies, 
I certainly don't want to be accused of constructing a straw man argument against transhumanism. So in an effort to bring the transhumanist philosophical debate up to our present day, and giving other people a chance to make their argument for transhumanism, I'd like to turn to a documentary entitled Building Gods. This is a documentary which brings commentary from some of the leading scientists involved in the transhumanist movement, and offers some of their ideas about what we can expect in this merging of technology and humanity in the future. To be fair, the documentary also gives some limited time to at least one detractor of the transhumanist idea, but on the whole I would say the documentary tends to further the transhumanist argument rather than the argument against transhumanism. Now, it's a lengthy documentary which you can watch on Google Video, but to get an idea of the argument, I'd like to take a look at an excellent deconstruction of the ideas presented in Building Gods that was presented by Ad TV, a YouTube user who takes some of the clips from the Building Gods documentary and adds his own commentary. Let's take a listen to some of this video, which again you can find from the documentation section of CorbettReport.com. To set up some of the information presented in this video, it might be useful to note that certain terms like artelect, which is artificial intellect, or Terran, which is person who refuses to take some of the transhumanist or cyborgian implants of the future, are bandied about by the people who are part of this transhumanist movement. Included in this video is commentary from people like Dr. Kevin Warwick, a well-known proponent of transhumanism, who can be found online. Let's take a listen now to this video. Transhumanism is a movement which advocates the use of emerging technologies to enhance and guide human evolution. The movement itself is public relations. It's a marketing campaign. Its job is to acclimate the public to ideas such as implantable microchips. Now if you remember, not too long ago, even the existence of implantable microchips was a crazy idea. I mean, these things were unheard of. This is the realm of conspiracy theory. But now let's take a look at the scientists who are developing these technologies that the transhumanists so lovingly talk about. In 2002, the implant that I had then was positioned in my nervous system here. All right, at this point we've accepted the fact that Dr. Warwick put an implant himself back in 2002. Now let's move on to some more heavy stuff, like the relationship between artificial intelligence machines and humans. Now we all know what happened in the movie Terminator. How do we get around such a problem? They say, well, um, perhaps we could avoid this issue by having human beings themselves become artifacts. In practice, that would mean like adding, you know, adding components to your head, more chips on top of chips sort of thing. Now wait a minute, I didn't even want to get an implantable microchip in the first place. Now we're talking about brain chips, putting a chip in my actual brain. You can't tell me that people are actually going to want to do this. Uh, a lot of people who do want to upgrade themselves, no question about that. And there'll be commercial interests and political interests supporting those groups. There's a lot of money to be made here, a lot of power. I'm not even satisfied with the power structures that are present in this world right now, let alone giving the power of my brain away to somebody. And did you notice the buzzword you used in there, upgrade? As if you're going to be better if you do this? I mean, imagine you're a Terran and your next door neighbor starts going cyborg, right? starts adding components, and then suddenly the person next door is capable of learning a human language in just by, you know, in seconds. And this, of course, is the old marketing trick of snob appeal. But this time, your neighbor hasn't bought a new riding mower. He's added a brain chip to his head, which allows him to think in ways that you can't even imagine. He's become a super intelligent cyborg. At this point, transhumanism tries to sell you on the concept of abandoning humanity altogether. They want you to become what is known as a post-human, 
Otherwise, you're not going to be able to keep up in the new society. But I, I think when implants become more acceptable, as they are becoming bit by bit, so such people, the, the humanists that want to stay human, the, the Terrans maybe, as Hugo would call them, uh, they... I, I can't see them ultimately having much power because at the end of the day their intellectual capabilities will be so inferior to cyborgs, those that have implants and upgrades, that the cyborgs will be able to outthink the subspecies that still are human. Ah, so humans are a subspecies now. Can anybody see where this is going? Perhaps you remember Adolf Hitler and his concept of the Ubermensch, or the Superman. These guys have a serious god complex. They are sick individuals. But you are even sicker if you choose to follow them. So imagine uh, a young woman, she's just given birth, and then she, she needs to make the decision. Is she, is she going to have her baby modified? Is she going to turn that baby into a, a cyborg? or effectively an artifact. So say she, say she decides to do that. So this, you know, hypothetically, this grain of sand, in a sense, that's been nanotech, is uh, inserted into the human brain, that baby's brain, and it integrates itself into the brain. So that baby, in effect, is no longer human. So that woman, in a sense, has killed her baby. Killed in the sense the baby is no longer human. It's effectively an artelect. It's an artelect in human disguise. Okay, first hydrogen bombs are now killing babies. This is the kind of expert I should be listening to. Now let's see what Dr. Warwick says about anybody who has the audacity to actually resist this. So the future for an ordinary everyday human, I, I guess there'll be some sort of subspecies, uh, just like we have cows now, um, so we'll have humans in the future. There'll be other creatures, other species, cyborgs, in, intelligent machines, that are the dominant life forms on Earth. And as a cyborg, if a, a human came to see me and it starts making silly noises, a bit like a cow does now. If a cow comes to me and says, moo, 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 I, I'm not going to say, yeah, that's a great idea, I'm going to do what you tell me. So it will be with a human. Then they'll come in and start making the silly noises that we call speech and human language and so on. And I'll have these trivial noises. I'm not going to do those silly things. Why should I? This creature is absolutely stupid in comparison to me. And there you have the transhumanist sales pitch, brought to you, of course, by the experts. And if you didn't know, transhumanism is just the new face of eugenics, which you should look into. All this talk about super intelligence and how great it's going to be to be a cyborg is simply bait. This is an advertisement. Don't believe it for one second. This time, your brain is the product, and how can you possibly put a price on that? The fact of the matter is, you don't get to program the brain chip, so how do you know what it does? The general public hasn't been made aware of the transhumanist movement yet, but it's my contention that the mass marketing of this movement will happen in the near future. Consider this video a forewarning. The transhumanists also push the concept of downloading consciousness into a computer. This makes the concept of the movie The Matrix a reality. I'm not even going to try to explain the reasons why that's a bad idea. Let's just hear what Dr. Warwick has to say about it. Then if a machine is passing down signals that keep you completely happy, then why not be part of the Matrix? I, I really do think uh, Neo in the Matrix trying to destroy things, he's a bit of a party pooper. Um, life for humans in a Matrix could be really cool. Now, I think that commentator gives a pretty good breakdown of exactly why these transhumanist ideals only need to be scratched on the surface to reveal some very troubling implications underneath. It's important to note that this debate is taking place in scientific circles and is a rather lively one these days, with some really incredible stories coming out on both sides of the debate. Some glimpses into this debate might be gained from such articles as Human Species May Split in Two from BBC News, which states, quote, 
Humanity may split into two subspecies in 100,000 years' time, as predicted by H.G. Wells, an expert has said. Evolutionary theorist Oliver Curry of the London School of Economics expects a genetic upper class and a dim-witted underclass to emerge. The human race would peak in the year 3000, he said, before a decline due to dependence on technology. People would become choosier about their sexual partners, causing humanity to divide into subspecies, he added. The descendants of the genetic upper class would be tall, slim, healthy, attractive, intelligent, and creative, and a far cry from the underclass humans, who would have evolved into dim-witted, ugly, squat, goblin-like creatures. End quote. Again, this is not coming from a science fiction author, it's coming from an evolutionary theorist at the London School of Economics. And in fact, this debate in particular has been one of particular interest in genetic circles of late, with prominent Princeton geneticists like Lee Silver making very similar predictions about the splitting of the human race into two, namely the gen rich who can afford to get the upgrades and the designer babies, and the gen poor who of course will not be able to take part in this transhumanist evolutionary process, and thus will be left far behind. Now, Lee Silver seems to think the idea of splitting humanity into two species is a great idea, with the lower species being the natural workers and low-paid service providers or laborers for society. But there are others who disagree with him. And for a little bit of that debate, you might go to the Center for Genetics and Society at geneticsandsociety.org and look at an article entitled The New Eugenics, The Case Against Genetically Modified Humans, from November 30th, 1999. Now, all of this seems very philosophical and maybe a debate that can be had at leisure at some time in the future, but this is very much not the case. In fact, this debate is intruding very much into our most private spaces and into our personal lives, in a manner which cannot be ignored. One of the most obvious examples of how technology is merging with the human comes in an examination of the implantable microchip. One good place to start in interrogating this idea of merging technology and humanity in a very physical sense is to take a look at a story like this one from Newsmax.com from August 21st, 2006, entitled Implanted Chips in Our Troops. This article reads in part, quote, A Florida company wants to get under the skin of 1.4 million U.S. servicemen and women. Verichip Corp., based in Delray Beach, Florida, and described by the DC Examiner as one of the most aggressive marketers of radio frequency identification chips, is hoping to convince the Pentagon to allow them to insert the chips, known as RFID, radio frequency identification chips, under the skin of the right arms of U.S. servicemen and servicewomen to enable them to scan an arm and obtain that person's identity and medical history. The chips would replace the legendary metal dog tags that have been worn by U.S. military personnel since 1906. The device is usually implanted above the triceps area of an individual's right arm, but can also be implanted in the hand if scanned at the proper frequency. The Verichip responds with a unique 16-digit number, which can correlate the user to information stored on a database for identity verification, medical records access, and other uses. The insertion procedure is performed under local anesthetic, and once inserted, it is invisible to the naked eye. End quote. Again, it's important to note that this technology is not theoretical, it is very much here, and in fact was even being discussed back in 2005. Feds to fund controversial school surveillance. Hundreds of school districts have it, but now it's going to go to... What, what is it called here? Non-cooperative forms, face scanning and tracker chips. You see? And here's one. TiVo files patent for RFID video recorder based on implant chip. And where is it from? Information Week, industry publication. And it says you'll have an implanted chip. It's actually in the article. An implanted chip in you, and oh, it's your personal TiVo. It knows what you want. 
<laughs> I remember I used to tell people that their scientific Atlantic cable boxes have a microphone in them, number one, that engineers at local cable companies have told me is used by the government to listen to you. Okay? So I don't want to get a mean email from the local cable company, some employee going, you're full of it, I work there, we're, we're good. Yeah, you answer the phone, you're compartmentalized. I didn't say you were bad. The engineer telling me this wasn't bad five years ago. But TiVo is a separate DVR recording system, as many of you know. Records what you want. Fine. Remember, they go, we have the statistics, 2.4 million people reround and replay Janet Jackson's breast incident. And then the Chicago Tribune went, some normal person there went, how do you know they did that? Well, we track everything you do and build psychological algorithms and sell the data. And the Chicago Tribune goes, oh, really, you do, huh? Now, we already knew that. Not because I'm some genius. It's in industry publications. It says right here you're going to have a chip implanted in you. And if you, and if you want the new model of this coming out in a few years, you'll just have to have a chip. Says chip in the body. Information week off TiVo's press release. Chip in the body to watch TV. I'm sick of it. We're not radical here on this show. Andy Rooney gets up on TV and says, I better take a chip to prove I'm good. That piece of trash, Sean Hannity gets up and says it. And, 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 and the guy you just saw earlier, Pat Robertson, oh, I think I think an implantable chip's okay. Oh, I, in a past show, oh, I think, I think everything's all right. You know, I'm just tired of it, folks. I got another one here where in the future, if you want to go in the hospital, you got to have a chip, and they're already saying they'll give people better beds and discounts if they'll take a chip. Oh, you don't have money to get in the hospital? We have a federal grant, house half price on that surgery. Just take a chip. Why? Why take a chip? Why? Why? Anything to incentivize, anything to break the ice, any, and, and your kids. Kids, it's already happened. The defense department said they'd do it. We knew they'd do it. Now they've done it. And they're funding this. They said they were going to use fads to sell it. And already, your parents don't want you to have it. They're not cool. You're cool. I don't just have one chip. I have dozens. Everything I do is tracked. Ha, ha, ha. I'm anti-establishment. My mommy and daddy, those dumb Christians, they didn't want it. Or those dumb liberal parents of mine, they think it's Big Brother. I'll show them. I've got the new Igron 7 brain an analyzer stimulator sciatica connected. I went and got it in the new losses. I'm allowed to at age five. You can't keep me from having the technology. I've had top professors on that go, yes, we'll force you to have your brain chip soon, Alex. We deserve the future. You're not going to hold us back. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's twilight zone. Twilight zone. Come on. Once again, you cannot make this stuff up. And Alex Jones has hit the nail on the head by taking a look at that informationweek.com story. Again, you can find the link from CorbettReport.com. But it's very much the case that even back in 2005, TiVo was filing a patent for an RFID-based video recorder that would, quote, recognize viewer preferences through an RFID chip embedded in clothing, jewelry, or inserted somewhere in the user's body, end quote. Again, why you would need a chip inserted in your body simply to watch TV is another matter, but the very fact that they're suggesting this must mean something. Alex Jones also hit the nail on the head when he talked about the way this technology would be gradually introduced into society, first by marketing it to naive and rebellious youth as a sign of rebellion against the structures and strictures of society. A glimpse of the way that this type of technology could be introduced into society is given in an excellent article from the Toronto Star from December 10th, 2006, entitled, One Generation is All They Need. Quote, Employers will start to expect implants as a condition of getting a job. The U.S. military will lead the way, requiring chips for all soldiers as a means to enhance battlefield command and control and to identify human remains. From cooks to commandos, every one of the more than one million U.S. military personnel will see microchips replace their dog tags. Following quickly behind will be the massive security sector. Security guards, police officers, and correctional workers will all be expected to have a chip. 
individuals with sensitive jobs will find themselves in the same position. The first signs of this stage are already apparent. In 2004, the Mexican Attorney General's office started implanting employees to restrict access to secure areas. The category of sensitive occupation will be expensive to the point that anyone with a job that requires keys, a password, security clearance, or identification badge will have those replaced by a chip. Judges hearing cases on the constitutionality of these measures will conclude that chipping policies are within legal limits. The thin veneer of voluntariness coding many of these programs will allow the judiciary to maintain that individuals are not being coerced into using the technology. In situations where the chips are clearly forced on people, the judgments will deem them to be undeniable infringements of the right to privacy. However, they will invoke the nebulous and historically shifting standard of reasonableness to pronounce coerced chipping a reasonable infringement on privacy rights in a context of demands for government efficiency and the pressing need to enhance security in light of the still ongoing wars on terror, drugs, and crime. At this juncture, an unfortunately common tragedy of modern life will occur. A small child, likely a photogenic toddler, will be murdered or horrifically abused. It will happen in one of the media capitals of the Western world, thereby ensuring non-stop breathless coverage. Chip manufacturers will recognize this as the opportunity they have been anticipating for years. With their technology now largely bug-free, familiar to most citizens and comparatively inexpensive, manufacturers will partner with the police to launch a high-profile campaign encouraging parents to implant their children to ensure your own peace of mind. Special deals will be offered. Implants will be free, providing the family registers for monitoring services. Loving but unnerved parents will be reassured by the ability to integrate tagging with other functions on their PDA so they can see their child anytime from any place. Paralleling these developments will be initiatives that employ the logic of convenience to entice the increasingly small group of holdouts to embrace the now common practice of being tagged. At first, such convenience tagging will be reserved for the highest echelon of Western society, allowing the elite to move unencumbered through the physical and informational corridors of power. Such practices will spread more widely as the benefits of being chipped become more prosaic. Chipped individuals will, for example, move more rapidly through customs. Indeed, it will ultimately become a condition of using mass transit systems that officials be allowed to monitor your chip. Companies will offer discounts to individuals who pay by using funds stored on their embedded chip, on the small print condition that the merchant can access large swaths of their personal data. These discounts are effectively punitive pricing schemes, charging unchipped individuals more as a way to encourage them to submit to monitoring. Corporations will seek out the personal data in hopes of producing ever more fine-grained consumer profiles for marketing purposes and to sell to other institutions. End quote. Now that lengthy and detailed article gives a very good breakdown of exactly the stages that will be used to introduce this type of technology to society and to make it the accepted norm. Indeed, it's important to stress that the idea of the social norm, conforming to societal standards, will be an integral part of this process. By making it imperative that you get this chip to fit into society, the people behind this agenda will have secured the compliance of a large percentage of the population, people who are too afraid to speak out against things that they know to be wrong if everybody else is doing them. Now, stepping back, the idea of the implantable chip is just one small facet of the larger transhuman agenda, but undoubtedly an important one, and one that is here now. Other logical extensions of this type of technology and furthering of the transhuman agenda, of course, include the brain chip, which again is not science fiction, but something being developed by DARPA, a branch of the U.S. Department of Defense, which I think it is in my listeners' best interest to investigate more into, and documents relating to that can be garnered from the documentation section of today's episode. But other facets of the agenda can also rely on simply brain chemistry, as a way of enhancing the human experience. And another troubling aspect of that comes from a Daily Mail article from the 19th of September 2008, 
headlined school children could be given smart drugs in a bid to boost brain power. I won't read that article right now, but if you want to listen to an excellent breakdown of that article, I suggest you go to cuttingthroughthematrix.com and check out the September 22nd, 2008 edition of Cutting Through the Matrix from the Republic Broadcasting Network. That show is hosted by Alan Watt, a researcher who has appeared before on the Corbett Report. It just so happens that after that very story, in which Alan Watt begins to get into some of the aspects of transhumanism, I was the first caller which he spoke to in that episode of Cutting Through the Matrix. And I had the opportunity to ask him about the transhuman agenda and what can be done about the direction in which society is heading. Yes, on your program in the past, you've promoted the idea that the elite agenda for humanity is unfolding and we can't hope to stop that agenda, only change its course. And I think transhumanism is one example of that, because as we know, you can't put the scientific research genie back in the bottle. Scientists are still going to keep working on their brain chips and all the rest of it. What then is your idea for derailing or changing the course of this transhumanist agenda? Is there any way we can effectively commandeer such a movement or throw it off course? What they've been aiming at primarily are the minds of the up-and-coming children who watch all the science uh, fiction movies that are churned out, even cartoons. They're hooked on them. Every hero has special implants that give them special abilities, and they really believe that they'll be given this themselves one day. And so they're for it. So we have to really, it's the communication between parents and adults and children that's been severed. And that's the only way you could really knock this off course is if the children know some of their history, some of the history about what's been done to the to the general public over the centuries, and also um, the mindset of the elite and what happened and the dirty tricks they have done on their own population down through the centuries, and and also to educate them as to the real reasons these big corporations are working in particular directions. You understand that. All research and development is is run on grants. They don't pick the direction they want to go in. They're told where to do the research by the big foundations that fund them. And and when you see the, the pattern of funding, direct funding towards specific, specific agendas, then you know that that is the future that has been agreed upon to be brought into the world by big um big foundations, big think tanks, very rich people, very old families. Uh, that's who directs all of the research and development that goes on today. You can't go into research and development without getting millions to back you, millions of dollars, and doors opened for you too to allow you to continue in that research. So therefore, that should be a red flag right away. The elite have always had the one problem of how to control an efficient public and this is where it's all going towards. At the, the, the Loyola meeting they had a few years ago at um, Loyola University, the, the World Science Organization uh, that was headed by Newt Gingrich, he, he, he opened it up. He talked about the brain chip. And the, in fact, it was a scientist from Japan who gave the main speech, and he said, this new world we're bringing in will have people across the planet all connected to centralized computers that will program them. He said, you will, you will have no quietness in your head. You'll hear the whispers of commands being issued to those around you and from, from those people back to the central computer. And he said, no one will be able to, to think of themselves as a distinct, separate individual anymore. He said, think of it more like the beehive. That's the term he used. This is the world they're going to bring in, but they also want to bring in new types of efficient, purpose-made, ideal design. The other reason, the other meaning of ID is ideal design. Uh, so they'll have ideal designed humans for specific tasks, exactly as Plato talked about 2,300 years ago. For my full conversation with Alan Watt, please go to CorbettReport.com and you'll find it under the Interviews tab. Alan Watt made several important points in that answer to my question, but if I may summarize his answer, 
It is that the key is to informing others of the larger agenda behind the transhumanist philosophy. Of course, these technologies are not coming out of nowhere. They are being funded by large organizations for a very specific purpose. And it is our point to draw the attention of those who are receptive to this philosophy to those larger organizations. Once again, we come back to the fundamental philosophy of eugenics, which explains what the transhuman agenda is really about. For another excellent dissection of eugenics and how it relates to transhumanism, I'll put a link to an excellent article from Daniel Taylor of oldthinkernews.com from August of last year, up in the documentation section of today's episode. I suggest you check out that article as well as other articles on eugenics from oldthinkernews.com and look for future articles on this subject from that website in the future. Of course, technology is a double-edged sword and does promise incredible wonders, the likes of which seem like fantasy and science fiction to us right now. But it's also important to keep in mind that technology always filters down from the very top, the elites who control the money, which controls the grants, which controls the development of new technologies. And new technologies, of course, are always developed for military applications first, and the military always gets first dibs on whatever technology is available at the time. We have no way of knowing what technologies are here right now being developed and being implemented by the Department of Defense and others. But we know that this technology will be used in the war for full-spectrum dominance, which has been declared by the Pentagon. And we know that that war is a war against us all. The post-human world could so easily be a world of dictators controlling the masses through technology. It is that vision of society that we have to work against. Not technology itself, but the very societal structures which will permit such a society to come into existence. Again, information is the key. Get informed and get others informed. <laughs>